Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this new episode of the Rose and Rubini podcast. My name is Manas Chavla, and as always, I'm joined by CEO and head of research, Brunella Rosa. Uh, there's, there's much happening this week, uh, but one of the key stories that we're covering is the general election happening this Sunday in Italy, uh, which is coming after many months, perhaps years, of political turmoil in the country uh, and uh, is, is ripe for discussion. Uh, Bruno, how did we get here? First of all, there's no confidence process triggered. Who triggered that? Uh, and, and how did we get here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the event of the week, although, of course, many things are happening. We got the Fed, uh, we got the Bank of England, we got these threats by Putin on potentially use of nuclear weapons. Nonetheless, democracies carry on and uh, elections still happen. And this is the true return of, of Italy after uh, Germany first, September 2020, and then France in, uh, earlier this year earlier this year. Uh, Italy was not scheduled to have elections until um, 2023, in fact. The early part, admittedly, perhaps February, March, up to May, I think, elections could be called stretching the limits of, the, of this parliament. But in reality, there was a big um, fight among the various members constituting the national unity political majority that supports Draghi's government in July. And uh, that led to a so, so, sort of de facto no confidence vote. So in reality, Draghi never received a formal no confidence vote, but he received just um, a few votes and the vast majority of MPs did not participate in the vote itself, which he interpreted as no confidence in his government, which is the reason why he resigned first, then Mattarella sent him back to the chambers, and then uh, this entire saga of the, as I said, de facto no confidence votes occurred, and therefore he resigned, and then it, that precipitated uh, early elections. Mattarella, the president of the Republic, could have in fact tried to keep this parliament alive for a little longer by appointing another government, but he realized that it was impossible to find another person that could command the majority as large as Draghi. Also because in this parliament there's already been uh, lots of changes. It started as the uh, five-star Lega government, super yeah. populist was called or something along those lines. And then it became a five-star PD government, so sort of center-left. So center-right, center-left, and then something like national unity, where Meloni was the only one in opposition. And this has failed now, this um, uh, has collapsed, this government, and, um, and therefore uh, Mattarella was left with no major choices than uh, other choices than called for early elections. Right. Um, and like you say, I mean, the, the coalition that Draghi had put together was uh, in many ways a very fractious one. Uh, essentially, almost every kind of political party represented except uh, Meloni's Fratelli d'Italia. Uh, and now that is kind of the largest sort of opposition. Um, what, what odds do they fare in the upcoming election? Do you think they'll win? Uh, and uh, there's something peculiar about this election you pointed out in your views letter. Uh, it's the fact that the number of MPs has been drastically reduced. What sort of uh, effect might that have? Yeah, so we believe there are a couple of interesting points ahead of this election. First, constitutionally, there has been a change. Uh, there was a referendum in 2020 to reduce the number of MPs after the reform that the Five Star pushed for many years. It passed, and then it went to the uh, uh, constitutional referendum for final approval, and that happened in, in, in 2020. Number of MPs have been drastically reduced. In the chamber from 630 to 400, in the Senate from 315 to 200. So is a you know a de facto halting of the representation, um, which means that most parties will have to give up lots of MPs. In fact, the only party that is not going to give up MPs is going to be Fratelli d'Italia. That is the second reason why this is an interesting election effectively uh, the political spectrum will shift 
drastically to the right. Um, Fratelli Italia was the only party in opposition, so can claim that, you know, um, after the failure, if you want, the collapse at least of uh, Draghi's government is his turn to, to have a go in government. And, um, and clearly, last time they got four, four and a half, five percent, or even, and this time around, they are pulling around 25 percent. So, you imagine they are uh, trebling or quadrupling even more so their number of MPs. So, definitely, their representation in parliament will increase even with the reduced uh, size parliament. All other parties instead will have to drastically shrink, which has forced lots of parties to. Uh, kind of nasty choices among the various right. politicians, but nobody's crying for that, clearly. Yeah. So if it looks like there's going to be roughly a center-right uh, coalition in government, yeah. it looks like a Maloney is going to lead that. What would a Maloney government look like? How would it be different from previous administrations? So it's, it's going to be a pretty different one. Uh, first of all, it's going to be a super huge step for this party that has been effectively the, the sequences post, uh, post World War II, there was a small um, post-fascist party called Movimento Sociale Italiano, Italian Social Movement, that in the 90s, early 2000s, transformed itself in um, uh, Alleanza Nazionale under Finis. Fini started this long journey towards the center. Then it was merged with Forza Italia with Berlusconi to form what was called at the time Popolo uh, d'Italia. And then they splintered again. And from the splinter, they, Forza Italia re emerged and this new formation was created, Fratelli d'Italia, effectively, with, with the vast majority of what used to be Alleanza. Nazionale. Now, uh, and you see that in the symbol because it's a series of concentric circles. At the very center, at the very bottom of it, there is still the flame that represents the, the flame of Mussolini coming out of the grave mm. of the former dictator uh, that has been kept since the very uh, right. beginning of, of this process. Now, you can imagine this has never happened. It's like the pendulum of history has moved way back where it was 70 years ago. Uh, but apart from the ideological discussion, which could be more or less interesting, there's the most important element is this, this party effectively has not been in power in any major either city or region. In fact, the only one that has been uh, in, in, in power recently has been the market region that was recently devastated by a flood in there. And in fact, there has been the usual accusers of incompetence for the new administration and so on and so forth. Admittedly, all administration would have probably suffered the same criticism, but, um, but clearly this is not going to be different from previous parties. So the biggest problem of all, I believe, is the lack of experience of this political class, which in the vast majority of cases doesn't even exist Mm. because you need time to build the political class right. that is up for government. And clearly, uh, and clearly Maloney's part is not ready for that just yet. Right, right. And, and how is, I mean, most importantly, how is the market reacting to this? Because there is a lot of volatility. Italy's numbers aren't looking good. The, the debt to GDP ratios aren't looking good. Um, what's the market reaction like and what can we expect it to be over the next few weeks? So to some extent, the market has already discounted the Meloni's victory. She's playing reassuring with Europe, which by far could be uh, the biggest um, uh, obstacle to whatever she might want to be. But I don't think that she's going to be, let's say, um, as stubborn as Salvini and Di Maio in the 2018 government when they went and clashed directly with the EU and they got badly defeated clearly because all other European countries are saying, look, there are treaties, you have to respect them, these are the rules, you want them, you benefit massively from them, so, uh, you know, just respect them. It took 
a severe battle to get there. I don't think Meloni will go through that. There's no point. You mm. will, she will lose that battle anyway. Um, Italian governments don't last more than 30 to 15 months on average. So you can expect the Meloni government to last no more than what, 15 months. Yeah. So at the, at the end of the route, we will be back to square one. So I don't think she will she would choose the direct confrontation with the EU. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and so she's trying to play reassuring with, with various constituencies. However, when she when she's with other type of constituencies, the, her, her electors, uh, she tends to be, to have a much more inflammatory uh, kind of rhetoric uh, against the EU, against the um, LGBT community against the environmentalism, you know, all the typical right wing themes that she flags together with the Vox party in Spain, for example, or similar. So these are extreme right parties. They are not, they are not talking about centrist. Now, she can be relatively moderate, and then in, everything will depend on who she would choose as finance, finance minister. One other annotation I'd just like to make before including this question is, it really depends uh, on the numbers of MPs in parliament, because if Fratelli d'Italia and the centre-right have at least two thirds of MPs, they would be able to, in fact, change the constitution without, without going through the confirmation referendum we spoke about before. And this means that they would probably spend most of their political capital and energies to get this reform done and introduce a, pre a presidential system that would allow the president to be elected directly by the population, which has always been a major uh, kind of uh, reform that right, the right wing parties wanted to do. If instead they are below the 60%, 66%, so this to the majority, there's no reason to spend so much energy on a constitutional ref a reform that is unlikely to go anywhere. Right. Which means they would focus much more on the usual citizenship rights and then uh, minority rights and uh, you know all that kind of stuff. The real question is how much they want, how much importance they want to give the economy. In the first case, probably a little bit less so, more important is the constitutional reform. In the second case, probably more important to the economy and the, uh, um, and the implementation of the uh, recovery and resilience plan, uh, and which they have already said they want to revisit. And this is what has unsettled market for, for a bit. So, uh, the spread is already beyond 200 basis points, it can reach 300 in case of a resounding victory and, uh, and other inflammatory declarations, but it may also subside if instead Meloni shows to be really a moderate and she appoints a finance minister that is uh, moderate and mainstream instead of being confrontational with the EU. Right. It seems like sort of uh, from what I've been kind of gathering is Italian politics in general, you know, the person at the top might change, the rough ideologies of the parties might change, there's a few things that stay constant, right? There's always going to be fractious coalitions, there's always going to be a relative level of instability in how long a government lasts, there'll always be the risk of antagonism with the EU, and uh, perhaps what this election is about is lots of that continuity, uh, and perhaps not a very surprising shock on Sunday when the election happens. Um, but as always, Bernal, thank you so much uh, for your advice and insight. Thank you very much. Until next time.